Um, I wanted to welcome everyone to RBMS, or sorry, ACRL's Rare Books and Manuscripts section, Bibliographic Standards Committee's program planning groups, which is quite a mouthful. Um, panel on Controlled Vocabulary and You. We will be hearing short presentations from members of the African American Seiko Funnel, the Chicano Thesaurus, the RBMS Controlled Vocabularies Group, and Lawi Lao Kaike, after which we will have time for discussion and questions and answers. Um, so please stay on mute. Obviously, that's actually more of an issue for those of us who are presenting. And put any questions in the chat with a question mark or the word question. Um, if you identify as a member of a historically marginalized group and would like to do so, please feel free to add an asterisk for progressive stacking. Liz? Um, we would like to thank the ACRL for hosting this webinar and Amber Billy for moderating. Thank you, Amber. Thanks, ACRL. Amber is the Systems and Metadata Librarian at Bard College. She is the Vice Chair of the Core Metadata and Collection Section Leadership Team, Co-Chair of the Core Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and on the Editorial Board for the Homosaurus, a linked data thesaurus for LGBTQ plus community. Take it away, Amber. Hey, thank you so much, Liz. It's my pleasure to be moderating this panel with you all today. And I'm very excited to kick this off. Um, our first presentation for this afternoon or morning, depending on where you are at, is Stacy Ross, catalog, Cataloging and Metadata Librarian at University of Pittsburgh, Michelle J. Conquist, Special Collections Cataloger at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And they'll be talking to us today about reparative description and the African-American Seiko funnel. Thanks, Amber. Um, and thank you to the Bibliographic Standards Committee for organizing this panel. Um, our slides should be up on the next slide. Can we get the next slide, please. Oops. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Stacey Ross, cataloging co-chair of the African American Subject Funnel Project, and I'm joined by my fellow cataloging co-chair, Michelle Conquist, to discuss the work of the funnel around reparative description. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to start with a background on LCSH, how updates to the vocabulary address reparative description in archives and cataloging, and then I'll give a brief background on the funnel. Then Michelle will share some case studies of the funnel's reparative work around LCSH. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so a bit about the Library of Congress. It was established around 1898 and translated into several languages. Um, it is the most used subject controlled vocabulary in the world. Um, and it's used by libraries of all sizes and types. Therefore, it has um, a huge global impact. Uh, next slide, please. Um, however, the vocabulary contains many inherent issues due to its long history. Um, we're all familiar with outdated terminology in LCSH, such as the contentious Indians of North America. However, um, updating LCSH can be quite onerous. Um, also, in spite of being widely used, LCSH can have glaring absences of well-known concepts. Uh, some areas have heavy coverage, while others are absent, such as um, terms like sundown towns, which is a common term in the history of BIPOC in America. Um, and while LCSH can be updated to address the above, some rules actually block the addition of new terms like Afro-Latin Americans. Um, next slide, please. Um, so reparative description is considered a good framework for addressing issues in LCSH. The Society of American Archivists Dictionary defines reparative description as the remediation of practices or data that excludes, silence, harm, or mischaracterize marginalized people in the data created or used by archivists to identify or characterize archival resources. This is also applicable to metadata and library catalogs and controlled access headings. Next slide, please. Applying this to LCSH means addressing gaps in the vocabulary by adding new terms and improving existing LCSH by updating to current usage. Um, outside of LCSH, reparative description can also take the form of establishing new vocabularies. And my fellow panelists will go into further detail on that later. Uh, next slide, please. 
So enter the African American Subject Funnel Project, which was established in 2000 to address terminology that reflects the African American experience. The funnel is part of LC's program for cooperative cataloging, or PCC, which was established to broaden access to provide high quality bibliographic and authority records. The funnel revamped in 2019 to actively engage in preparing and updating LC vocabulary terms related, related to African American people. Michelle's going to highlight a few examples of this work. Next slide, please. Hey, yeah, I'll just give a few examples of headings that we've worked on. Um, so one that we did uh, last year was we got the Great Migration added to LCSH, which you know, it was one of those things that it was, where it was really surprising that it wasn't in there to begin with. Um, so, um, and I'm just going to, because I saw a comment pop up, uh, explain what a funnel is. Um, a funnel is a group of people who, who group together to work on subject headings um, from different institutions. Um, so it used to be if you wanted to do subject cataloging of um, something about the Great Migration, you would have had to add these two very long strings of LCSH um, terms. Um, and so getting a specific term for the Great Migration added um, makes it um, easier to describe subject resources and allows us to use the language that we would expect our patrons to actually use in searching. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in another example that we worked on a few years ago was um, the term blackface. And uh, I just included an example of an abstract from a, a, a finding aid um, from my institution um, for an archival collection that includes uh, images of students wearing blackface. Um, it used to be that there just was no subject heading in LCSH for blackface. Um, and there, that meant that there was no way to accurately describe this resource um, and, and bring out that aspect of it. Um, so getting that term added to LCSH allows us to describe it more thoroughly. Next slide, please. And then we've also done some work to try to um, improve existing LCSH terminology. Uh, the big project that we did last year was to um, change the term blacks to black people and also whites to white people. Um, and that came out of the, um, directly out of the personal experience of the black members of our funnel who found the term blacks um, did not represent them and they found it offensive. Um, and we were able to uh, cite things like Merriam-Webster's dictionary um, to show that this usage had changed and had become increasingly offensive um, and needed to be updated to more up-to-date terminology. We were able to make that case to the Library of Congress and they did in, end up changing it. Uh, next slide, please. So um, please feel free to contact either of us if you have any questions about our work and I will turn it over to the next panelist. Great, thank you so much, Stacy and Michelle. Next panelist is Lillian Castillo-Speed. Uh, she is the head librarian of the Ethnic Studies Library, the database manager of the Chicano database at the University of California, Berkeley. Thanks, Amber. Um, as a library school student at UC Berkeley in the early 1980s, I discovered the Chicano Studies Library, which was one building over from the library school. There I learned that there was a Chicano periodical indexing project, and that they were using a tool called the Chicano Thesaurus. At the time, I didn't know what a thesaurus was, if it wasn't uh, Roger's thesaurus, and I was barely just learning what a Chicano was. Francisco Garcia Ivins, coordinator of the Chicano Studies Library at the time, and director of the Chicano periodical indexing project explained the project to me. And I ended up writing a paper about the thesaurus for one of my library school classes. It was later published in a book called Bibliopolitica, Chicano Perspectives on Library Service in the United States, which itself was published by the library. So here's what I found out about the Chicano thesaurus. Next slide, please. The Chicano movement of the 60s and 70s generated a flowering of journals and magazines expressing Chicano art, philosophy, political theories, sociology, law, history, health, literature, et cetera. Um, and for example, here are some of the journals. And in the next slide, you'll see some more. 
There's Chicano Law Review, El Grito, which was published at Berkeley, and Caracol. That was uh, wonderful. All these were just wonderful examples of that uh, flowering, I said, of the, of the Chicano movement. Next slide, please. So here's what I also found out about the Chicano Thesaurus project. Chicano movement journals were not indexed in mainstream indexing tools. At the time, that would be the uh, Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature published by H.W. Wilson. So they were not there. So a group of librarians created an index to Mexican American journal articles. They consciously chose vocabulary to reflect the Chicano experience. That experience was at the center of the universe of the Chicano thesaurus. You didn't need to say literary criticism as related to Chicanos or a term such as Chicanos in education. It was understood that literary criticism in the thesaurus or education in the thesaurus applied to the Chicano experience. They also wanted the terms to be precise, whether in Spanish or English, and they wanted them to be respectful. So it was a deliberate effort to create metadata justice. Even though the thesaurus was a necessary tool to index the materials for the Chicano Periodical Index, which later became the Chicano database, the creators did see it as a political act. Next slide, please. So this is on the left-hand side, you see the cover of the first thesaurus edition. Uh, and on the right, the, you know, the little paragraph that tells how the thesaurus works. Uh, it, it was based on the Eric thesaurus of post-coordinate terms. And it was published in August of 1979. And it was compiled by, long name, compiled by the Committee for the Development of Subject Access to Chicano Literatures. The, the publishers were the Chicano Studies Library at UC Berkeley and also the Colección Toloque Nahuaque at UC Santa Barbara. Next slide, please. And this is, all, this is a detail of the uh, thesaurus index terms uh, showing, uh, this is part of the explanatory part of the thesaurus telling uh, what the different parts of the thesaurus refer to with narrower terms, broader terms, related terms, et cetera. The thesaurus was used by indexers across California and the Southwest to index Chicano journals for the Chicano Periodical Index. Over the years, as the database grew and changed, the thesaurus also changed. For example, when the database incorporated the citations from the bibliography called Arte Chicano, the thesaurus added many art terms, such as exhibits, and the term art organizations and groups. Also, the database later expanded to include books, articles in books, and newspaper articles, which also brought in more terms. So it wasn't just the journal articles that were being indexed. Later, as the database manager, I worked with a colleague, Yolanda Redder Vargas at UCLA, to include terms related to LGBTIQ persons and also the correct terms related to other Latino groups in the United States. For example, Salvadoreños rather than Salvadorans or Salvadorians. So that was in 2007 when Yolanda and I worked on that project. As political events occurred and attitudes emerged, we added terms such as anti-immigration sentiment and racial profiling we are not sure if we will need to add the term, I hope we don't have to, to add the term family separation as a regular thesaurus term. Currently, it is a supplementary term. Last slide, please. So I'm glad to answer any questions about the Chicano thesaurus or the Chicano database. Thank you. Thank you, Lillian. Our next presentation is is by Ryan Hildebrand. Ryan is the Authorities and Special Collections Cataloging Librarian at University of Oregon. He'll be discussing prejudicial works and controlled vocabulary for rare materials cataloging. Um, thanks, Amber. Um, can we go ahead and advance to the next slide, please? 
So today I will be talking about the Prejudicial Materials Working Group, which is a subgroup of the Controlled Vocabularies Editorial Group of the Rare Books and Manuscripts section, part of ALA, ACRL. The editorial group oversees the content and publication of the resource, Controlled Vocabulary for Rare Materials Cataloging, or as we hope everyone will start saying, CVRMC. Uh, I've been involved with this vocabulary pretty consistently since about 2004, either as a volunteer, editorial group member, chair, or co-chair. Currently, I am a member of the editorial group and convener of its Prejudicial Materials Working Group, which began meeting in the summer of 2020. Um, in this presentation, I will briefly introduce our work, talk about a key area of our focus, which is the prejudicial works terminology and its evolution, and we'll introduce some of the new terminology generated by the group. Next slide, please. So the purpose of the Prejudicial Materials Working Group is to review, revise, and generate new terminology useful for indexing works that are prejudicial in nature or that are the byproduct of prejudicial or outright hateful systems and ideologies. Uh, also to review and revise the structure of this area of the vocabulary. But uh, first I should say a little bit about the vocabulary in which this work sits. Next slide, please. Controlled vocabulary for rare materials cataloging, currently in beta form, you can find it online, but please do not use it until we make our big announcement, provides standardized terminology for retrieving special collections materials by form, genre, or physical characteristics often of interest in special collections. The vocabulary is hosted by the Library of Congress at id.loc.gov as part of its linked data service. The resource is, in essence, an integration of the vocabularies hosted currently in a frozen state at rbms.info, with which many special collections catalogers are familiar with under the name RBMS Controlled Vocabularies. Next slide, please. This resource comprises the content of six previously published physical thesauri, along with a list of relationship designators. The first of the thesauri genre terms of the source for use in rare book and special collections cataloging was published by ACRL in 1983 with the initial work beginning several years earlier. Um, next slide, please. And this is the genesis of our current work. Um, the literature of prejudice term and its narrower terms here, anti-Catholic literature, anti-clerical literature, anti-Masonic literature, and anti-Semitic literature. Next slide, please. By the time the second edition of genre terms was published in 1991, a number of additional narrower terms had been added, anti-communist literature, anti-homosexual literature, anti-immigrant literature, white supremacist literature, and xenophobic literature. Next slide, please. Um, when the RBMS controlled vocabularies went live online in 2005, um, well, by the time they were frozen in 2018, rather, literature of prejudice had gained a scope note, as had several of the narrower terms, but additional narrower terms had not been added. Around this time, again, 2018 or so, there had been discussion on the fact that the term literature of prejudice is not sufficient to address the variety of formats in which prejudicial materials manifest, for example, graphics and printed music. A review of the terms also showed that the vocabulary did not adequately address the wide variety of prejudices we see in our materials. A core task of our group is to remedy the vocabulary on both points. So now in 2022, the former literature of prejudice terms look like this. Next slide, please. And I should point out that each of these terms has a full term record with a scope note and for brevity and screen space, I've included just the terms only. And some of these terms will have further narrower terms and narrower, narrower terms as you'll see in a moment. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we have also made adjustments to other existing terms and added new terms. For example, anti-homosexual literature led to anti-queer works, which has the narrower terms homophobic works and transphobic works. 
a new term, racist works, is useful in itself, but also provides an umbrella for several other new terms, such as anti-Asian works, anti-Black works, anti-Indigenous works, and anti-Latin American works. Slide, please. Here is a list, I hope I caught everything, of all the new terms that uh, we added so far. And note there are two um, relationship designators as well. And in closing, I want to point out that this presentation is just a snapshot and this isn't a stopping point. The terminology is not regarded as exhaustive and we still have further work outlined. Upon completing our initial round of work, the relevant terms um, that we've added by this group will be circulated broadly for community review. Uh, further, the evolution of the RBMS vocabularies has always been largely user-driven, and this area of the vocabulary is no exception. So once this is live, um, controlled vocabularies for rare materials catalog and the resource will include a mechanism to allow proposal of new terms or to request changes, as has long been the case. And finally, although this work exists within the context of a vocabulary geared toward rare materials cataloging, I would suggest that there is absolutely no reason why it should not be used as appropriate in the cataloging of material for general collections. And uh, next slide, please. I just wanna quickly acknowledge current and past members of this working group how, who have devoted so much of their time and energy to this. Um, that's it for me, thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. And our final presentation today is Siobhan Matsuda, the librarian at the University of Hawaii Maui College, who will be speaking to us today on the Lao Alao Kaike uh, Thesaurus, creating community controlled vocabularies. Mahalo, Amber. Uh, aloha, everyone. Today I'm going to share with you about Lao Alao Kaike. Um, I listed the project website here for you on the first slide in case you want to check it out while I'm speaking. Uh, next slide. The principal question we investigated as part of this project was how can we better support uh, the normalization of Olelo Hawaii and enhance access to Hawaiian knowledge that is kept in uh, libraries, archives, and other repositories in Hawaii and across the world. Slide. So our approach has been how do we develop something with community and for community? And part of this project uh, was aimed to identify an actual work plan for creating community controlled um, and community driven uh, controlled vocabularies across collections with appropriate cultural protocols. And inclusion of stakeholders um, is critical to the success of this project. And in our opinion, any project that seeks to develop a controlled vocabulary or improve access meaningfully uh, for our communities. And so we met with local repositories, folks who hold titles such as cataloger, metadata specialists, but also those who may not hold those titles or on MLIS, but uh, work are working actively on the ground with these collections. And what we wanted to do was gather, examine, gather and examine their metadata practices, but also plant the seed to start to grow a network of people who are focused on this area locally. Uh, second, uh, we convened, oh, sorry, still on that. Second, we convened focus groups uh, with Hawaiian communities of practice. So educators, cultural practitioners uh, and doctoral students and the focus of those conversations were to identify Hawaiian frameworks for knowledge organization. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So in those conversations with folks, we're looking at terminology, but understanding that it's not just as simple as adding Hawaiian language terms to a larger controlled vocabulary, rather it's an entire approach to knowledge organization. And that approach for us, of course, being particular to Hawaii is the Hawaiian epistemologies. And so on with the two images to the right, I wanted to just give you a peek of the activities that we did with focus groups. And I'm happy to go into more detail about those in the Q&A if anyone is interested. Um, but that giant sheet there with the post-it notes on them, we had also like tactile things in our, in our activities. Uh, but I wanna bring your attention to the word cloud here on the screen. 
Um, if there are words that you don't know, it's probably Hawaiian language terms, just to give you a heads up. Uh, but these are the terms and concepts that came out of our discussions. We collected lots of data, as you can imagine. This is just a snapshot of it. Um, but a lot of the things that came up, as you can see here, uh, and I'll just highlight two for you, Pilina, which is the importance of relationships. Um, and I'm simplifying this just for the sake of time. Uh, and mana, which is uh, oh, Lucy, um, I guess it's been translated as power, but can also be like your, your essence or energies. Um, and so with those two things, I wanted to highlight for you folks, and, and it's no surprise to this group, right? The importance of controlled vocabularies and the importance of naming um, for access to knowledge, but also in the ways that we interpret meaning and memory and all of those things. Um, like, so again, this was just a sneak preview into what we did. Uh, no, you can, you're perfect timing. Uh, slide. Uh, so with all of that data, we decided with our uh, focus groups to prioritize these as the starting points for the controlled vocabulary. So these being Aina, Akua, and Kumuhana. I'll give you loose translations. Aina refers to land. Akua can be translated as the divine, supernatural, goddesses, gods, those kinds of things. Um, and Kumuhana we chose as just a general subject area. Um, but we primarily focused on cultural practices within that subject area. Uh, if you click one more time. So these are the mark fields that were identified for these uh, vocabularies. We initially thought we could go with uh, 600 fields, but eventually decided upon uh, using 900 field, local fields, um, mostly because of the hierarchical structure within these fields. And I gave you an example there, uh, right below the aina, moku puni, moku, and ahupua'a. So we not only wanted to include our own names of places in these fields, but we also wanted to represent the relationships uh, between aina and the way in which we understand aina. I think for others, this other ways of, of looking at land have focused on like conservation district or political or voting districts, those kinds of things. So these are the things for Hawaii that we, this is one example of the things that we look at when we understand uh, and come to know Aina. Uh, thank you. I saw the question pop up. So normalize, we are working with Hawaiian language vocabularies. And so right now, the limitation, not with the language, but with the technology at the moment, uh, has to do with how we can search with diacritic markings. And so we had to include two fields for each, one that did not include diacritic markings and another that did include it. Um, so that's why each of these, although the terms may be pointing to the same things, um, we needed to include separate fields. Of course, the normalized fields are used for retrieval only, so they're not displayed. In, instead, we decided intentionally to uh, display the ones with the diacritic markings. Uh, slide. Uh, finally, we worked with uh, the Uluko, the Hawaiian Electronic Library. They get something like a million hits a month. Uh, so they're a really significant resource for Hawaii and Hawaiian resources. If you haven't heard of them, plug here. Um, uh, but we wanted to pilot the CVs and, and evaluate what its impact on access would be. And so thankfully, Uluko allowed us to create a beta site in which we tested these. And these are just uh, screenshots here for you to take a look, but the Uluko did decide to make these uh, permanently part of their search functions. So if you visit their website and I can drop it into the chat in a bit, uh, you can actually test these out. I will give you a word of caution. These are for very, very early instances. Um, but we also, as you can see on the right, wanted to explore with other ways of experiencing the search. So we had a, a visual um, search in which you would, in theory, be zooming in, again, from uh, island level to district level and then smaller districts. Um, again, another way of experiencing, but also you may not know the name and you may be able to search visually. The controlled vocabularies, though, underlying this uh, is what allows this to happen. Uh, and we're, again, waiting for uh, uh, capabilities to 
to grow in order to um, enhance these types of search functions for the future. Um, but again, as I said, this is part of the actual site and we plan to continue to grow the CV and apply the CV uh, to additional collections within Ulukal. And ultimately our plan is to apply the CV or, and implement them across uh, other Hawaiian collections. Again, starting with those in Hawaii with major uh, Hawaiian knowledge collections, but Hawaiian knowledge materials are found across the United States and other countries. And so we hope that this would eventually become, uh, be able to be applied across those as well. Uh, slide. Uh, and so on this slide, I list our, our partners. I, I talked about our stakeholders and those that we worked with, uh, but I also wanted to acknowledge those of the institutional partners that assisted us. This was an IMLS funded project. Uh, and we were fortunate to receive IMLS funding under a national leadership grant to continue this work. Uh, and then the next phase we've named Kauai Hapai. I won't go into detail here, but this is just another heads up that it wasn't just uh, this one project, that was really the initial uh, start to set the foundation and we are continuing this work and growing our team. So we now have a larger team. Originally, uh, the, the primary team was myself and Kia Hiahi Long, uh, who I think is here in the room. Uh, but we have since grown to include others in the University of Hawaii and are actively working with those in our community, both in libraries and in our, and in our community in terms of our Hawaiian community. Uh, so with that, I'll say mahalo for having me, and I look forward to answering any questions and continuing this discussion with you folks. Mahalo. Wonderful. Thank you, Siobhan, and thank you to all of our speakers um, for their presentations and an introduction to all their amazing projects. Um, that gives us plenty of time for our discussion. Uh, so let's, we've had a number of questions come in through the chat. Some of them are very just straightforward questions, and I think that I'm going to begin with those um, just to get some of the answers right away, and then we'll sort of bring in more of the broad questions and, and really kick into a discussion. Um, so the first question is for, um, is for Stacy and Michelle. Um, you mentioned a lot of uh, new changes that you've introduced to LCSH, such as great migration. When did those changes become active? Are they available for use today? Yeah, the great migration was established last fall. Um, and uh, all, all, the, all the, the ones that I talked about have been um, in LCSH for a while. Okay, great. Um, and let's go the next question for Lillian. Um, the question came from the chat. I don't see a lot of use of the Chicano thesaurus and WorldCat. Would it be appropriate to use terms from the thesaurus for materials that aren't specific to Chicanos, such as works about other Latinx communities? Well, that's a good question. Um, haven't thought about that. Um, and just in general, I don't even know, uh, you know, if, you know, how thesaurus term, if, you know, how catalogers, um, if they can use terms from other lists while they're doing their, you know, uh, world cat type cataloging. So um, um, if the person wants to contact me and we could talk about it, that would be, I, I'm open to that. Um, the terms are, um, uh, I'm just I'm just trying to think of any terms that might be, um, yeah. I think there could be some terminology that um, could be could be converted into or shared to be uh, subject head, uh, LCSH uh, headings. So maybe I should leave it at that. <laughs> but I'm open to more discussion if somebody wants to contact me about that. Great, thank you. Um, all right, and then let's jump. Let's jump to Siobhan. Um, you know, translations for terms like mana is, is so fascinating. So how, how do you handle that in your project? We are actually not focused on translation, um, at least in this phase, in the early phases of our project. And, and I might even say at all. Um, instead, our focus is on our Hawaiian community, principally our Hawaiian language community, and, and we anticipate that community to grow with time uh, due to colonization and ongoing occupation by the US. Our language has been um, made illegal and then more recently uh, legal again. So our focus is on preservation of language and growing our community of speakers. 
And so in terms of translation, we actually are even trying not to uh, translate from English to Hawaiian, where, wherein that might be, for some of us, our natural inclination. I know you're asking about how we translate to English, or I'm assuming that is the, um, the focus here. But we are actually trying to decolonize ourselves in the ways that we think about this and do the work that we can in this moment, knowing that the next generation to come, they're just going to amplify this work to the next level. So hopefully that's the answer to your question in the way that we're not focused on tra English translation or English language at all. Okay, and another question for you, Siobhan. Um, who or what agency manages or looks after Ulukao? Yes, so Ulukao started off with Alulike and uh, University of Hawaii uh, Hilo. And so they are the primary folks that look after it, specifically um, uh, Bob Stoffer. He, I don't know, this is a larger event. So no one, locally, it's like you drop a name and people know who that is. Um, but it's under the university principally. Uh, and, but they work a lot with Hawaiian language immersion schools and educational and curriculum materials. Uh, and if you check out their website, which I highly recommend you do, uh, they have more information there at the bottom for you. Okay, great. And one last question for you, Siobhan. Um, have vector word embeddings been created for the Hawaiian language? And have they been explored as a, mean of, a means of searching capability? I am not familiar. Can you repeat that vector word? I'm, I'm actually not familiar with this either. So if the person who asked this question could kind of explain this concept, um, have vector word embeddings been created for the Hawaiian language and have they been explored as a means for searching conceptually? I am not familiar with that terminology, but I'm writing it down. And whoever has that question, if you have a lead for us, please get in contact with me. I would love to explore more. Okay, great. And so now I'll go to Ryan. Ryan, we have a number of questions for you and I'm gonna start with the simplest one. Um, is, there a is there a time frame for the CVRMC? I love that new acronym. I can always like throw a new acronym in my pocket in this profession. Um, is there a time frame for the CR CVRMC going live? Hoping for summer. All right. <laughs> and um, let's see. When using, when you, so another question, when using literature of prejudice and its narrower terms, should they only be applied to avert hate literature, for example, Mein Kampf, but also to literature with negative stereotypes, such as Gone with the Wind? Um, so in the latter case, Gone with the Wind, that's gonna be an institutional or curatorial decision. I don't think that we can do anything within the vocabulary to to write a scope note that would lead you to any particular conclusion on that. Um, so as for works that evidence prejudice versus hatred, we established um, hate works separately to address that nuance. So um, <laughs> and in our conversations, it got really tricky because prejudice isn't always a negative thing. I think most of our terms approach it that way, but hate, hate works are um, treated separately. Okay. Um, on a similar, uh, similar vein, we have another question that came in. I wonder if there are terms for denialist works, Holoca Holocaust denial, Armenian genocide denial, if not in particular, but apologist and denialist. There probably are such terms out there. I'm not aware of them and would encourage their proposal. Um, so Holocaust denial itself, that's more like a subject. So Holocaust denial works or something like that. Something along those lines would absolutely make sense within this vocabulary. And actually having this as, as a note, um, I don't even know if I want to encourage the proposal because I think we'll just pick it up. Okay, and let's see, one more uh, sort of management question. Um, will the RBMS still be in charge of this vocabulary and review proposals for changes, even though it's hosted through 
um, ID.loc. Yeah, total total control is retained by us, and actually, it's it's been easier than ever. So our contact at LC Mate Trail, to whom many kudos are deserved, um, has been great in working with us to get changes made and um, uploading them swiftly. So we're in a really good position right now, probably better than ever before. That's so great. So happy to hear. Um, and you know, one last question that came in for the our the RBMS um, controlled vocabulary, but also I think could be answered by the African-American SACO funnel. Um, does anti-Black work have variant for anti-Black people work or something to match up with LCSH revisions? So I saw that. I saw that question come in and it doesn't have that. And the reason being is the nuance of the term isn't really anti-Black people. So I brought, the, I have the scope note in front of me and I'm going to read it. Um, Use for works that exhibit hostility toward or bias against people racialized as Black, comma, their respective cultures, comma, their rights, et cetera. So it's not just uh, works that are anti-Black people, but anti-Black culture. And if there's a better way to get at that than to say anti-Black works, um, we're totally open to to change in the preferred form. Okay, great. Um, all right, so that, that sort of concludes our very specific questions for each of our speakers that kind of, that came in through the chat. Um, we're gonna open this up for now, just conversation of uh, more general, um, general questions um, that have come in. Um, let's see. Anna Marie um, asked the question, could the presenters address how linked data technology makes this work easier or more challenging? I can jump in. Um, it, it, it makes it pretty much exactly the same for us because we're still using the same thesaurus management software and we have someone at LC who's doing the magic. Um, if, I think the only extra layer it adds is the knowledge that elements of your term record can be siphoned off and appear in various ways and you don't have control over them. So perhaps there's a bit more scrutiny knowing that the whole term record might not be seen by a person at any given time. Okay. Um... Andrea asks, in the case of creating a NACO authority record, would you recommend placing information such as tribal affiliation in the 670 field, if at all? Anybody wanna take a stab at answering Andrea's question? That's a big one. I will say, are, sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? So the question is, in creating a NACO authority record, would anyone recommend um, placing information such as tribal affiliation in the 670, if at all? I think my answer would be, and I, we don't have tribes here, would be uh, following our process to work with those tribes. Uh, again, I think the danger is applying a universal, we will always include this. And then to me, that opens up other questions such as what tribal name, I mean, where are you sourcing those tribal names from uh, when you even attempt to insert whatever it is that you're putting in those fields? And so to me, I think it's a great question, um, but maybe not for those of us in this group, uh, maybe those of whichever tribes you're working with, talk with them, see what they think, and also see what names they would uh, include, because it may be tribal names, not tribal name in those fields as well. Okay, um, thank you, Siobhan, for taking a stab at answering that and a very, very thoughtful answer. Um, does anyone know if anyone has been keeping a list of reparative um, language that has been made into LCSH recently?
Not that I know of. Um, I feel like if anything, maybe a Violet Fox at the cataloging lab might keep track of something like that, but I don't know that anyone has been. Yeah, that's what I probably, in, um, that's, I, I would think that as well. I think that um, the cataloging lab maintains a pretty, a pretty robust list. Um, so shout out to the work happening there. Um, all right. Let's let's open up to some more broad questions. Um, what has been the most exciting and the most challenging things about creating and remediating controlled vocabularies in thesauri? I'll take a stab at the challenging part. <laughs> um, there's fun. There's fun, but um, uh, and it just occurred to me as I'm listening to the other panelists and the questions that that um, things change over time and attitudes change over time and new vocabulary comes up through literature through the literature and it and what would be fine in one decade you know two decades later a decade later you know like oh no that that's not that words that term's not going to work you know and so just kind of keeping up with all that um and then figuring out what is the correct term and and what is what do we mean by correct um, and as uh, Sh um, Siobhan said, you know, talking to the, to the you know, uh, I think she mentioned the knowledge organization, you know, the, talking to people themselves, asking them, how do you want to be, you know, what do you think about this word? And, you know, that's a lot of work, you know, and I really admire everybody that is, would be in, is involved in that or thinking of being involved in that. So, um, so that's the, to me, that's, that's a challenge. That is a definite challenge. I would definitely echo that. So in our, in our work, probably the most challenging part would be the anti-terms that involve the demographic element. Um, just trying to come up with something, it's hard because you have to have one term and it's almost as if by settling on one term, you're saying this is the right one and the variant terms are wrong. And that's of course not at all what, we're, what we mean to do. But also what Lillian just mentioned about, you're, you're looking at literary warrant, you're looking at things that have been published, it changes over time, but the whole concept of warrant is kind of fraught because who has access to publishing? Um, how slowly do changes happen in that realm? Um, publishing is like a, a huge, it's thoroughly shot through with privilege. So what do you end up with when you require literary warrant for your terms? It's, it's just kind of a, a gross situation, but we do our best and put our best foot forward. And it is exciting to, in, in our case, because that was part of the question, all of this work is, is exciting to me. I've always loved it, but to work nimbly because we have a smaller organization um, and work on a resource that has a fairly broad reach is super cool. Um, well, what I've found exciting is um, since I've been working with the funnel is um, that I think we've been working more closely with the Library of Congress and have really um, been able to make a difference in um, uh, they've been really, especially in the last year, much more open to making changes to existing terms, which I think has always been a challenge in the past, um, trying to get things changed. Um, and also just being part of this funnel has has um, built we've really built a, a great community around doing this work um which you know subject heading proposal work can be kind of lonely normally you're kind of you're usually doing it by yourself but um doing it as part of a group um is is very satisfying um and we've just gotten so much done um what's challenging um is of course overcoming um the barriers that that are put in our way to have to having change happen um, such as sometimes policies at the Library of Congress. Yeah, I would, I agree with everything that's been shared so far. Uh, I would add similar to Michelle, what Michelle was sharing. I think what's been ex exciting about our project is that we've been able to engage with our communities about libraries. We For our project, we already had relationships with the folks we're working with, which made it easier, right, uh, to, to jump into this work. 
but there is still a lot of trauma in our Hawaiian community, as I'm sure in others, um, with the relationship with libraries and archives, as well as with the term research. So when going in with a project and saying, we're doing this research, that term in and of itself uh, still causes hurt and harm for us. And so that has been a challenge, but in the ways in which we've been able to move forward and grow these relationships and discussions, that's been really exciting uh, and brought folks into our libraries as well as um, just talking about libraries uh, in their own circles. Uh, and then in terms of challenges, uh, we could talk at length about challenges. So I don't wanna put too much focus there because I'm trying to get people to jump into this work. Um, but I will say that uh, we were having a lot of issues with technology and the limitations of technology to deal with uh, languages other than English, uh, and then also changing minds in terms of um, a lot of the work was trying to get folks to understand the importance of the this project that we're working on, and similarly, a lot of these initiatives, I'm sure, um, but not just opening up to see that, you know, this is part of social justice or any, any decolonization or those kinds of things, but also just changing the way in which we approach our work in libraries to know that consultation and working with communities, well, however you define that consultation and collaboration, because uh, it, it can manifest in many ways, but that is a part of our work in libraries. It is not an addition. Uh, it should just be taken as the way that we approach our work. And again, this means more resources probably, or more time, but instead of seeing that as a negative, seeing that as no, if we're actually gonna make change on the ground, this is the approach that we need to take. And that has been a hard conversation to have, especially within institutions. Anyone else wanna chime in? Okay, um, we got a we got an interesting question from Nadine, um, and I'm going to expand upon it. But Nadine asks, following on vendor whack-a-mole, is there something underway to help facilitate changes to their subject headings? Um, so, and this kind of just brings up, um, you know, how do we manage our subject headings and our controlled vocabularies? And we often are outsourcing to vendors. And, you know, the Homosaurus has been approached by vendors to have our terms be included in their in their um, controlled, uh, their authorities control services. So I'm curious what our panelists thoughts are on vendors using our vocabularies in their authority control services. Should we welcome this or are they profiting profiting off of our often volunteer labor? I actually read that question as more of um, when we have electronic resources records, for instance, they don't belong to our catalog. They are completely maintained by the vendors and they have their own internal um, control vocabularies that mean that they maintain, but it's, it's really difficult, nay impossible probably to, to every time you find something problematic and all of these headings are coming from a vendor, how do you address them and say, hey, How can we get you to stop putting this problematic terminology into our catalog? Um, I, the, I have no answer to that question because it's a problem that we have too, especially as being a, an Alma library. So we have even more uh, layers of removal of our power to change things. So um, that's probably the next step of trying to advocate, to advocate for um, inclusivity in subject headings um, to vendors. They're not gonna share their data with us. They're not gonna let us um, make changes to it, but at the very least we can establish some kind of collaboration moving forward to make sure this terminology is um, um, at least consistent across vocabularies. I'm really interested in working with vendors to get authority records in place. For, for our terminology. And uh, I've supplied lists to Backstage in the past so they could build records for their clients, but I don't believe it was made available as a general service. Could be wrong about that. But we go to so much effort to determine variants, which at this point, it's the, the only person making use of that is the cataloger searching for the term within the vocabulary. The library user 
who's you know searching for resources collocating on this controlled vocabulary term doesn't get the advantage of the variance and I would love for that to be somehow um, incorporated into our catalogs. <clears throat> for the Chicano thesaurus, uh, it's available through the Chicano database, um, which is available through a vendor. <laughs> um, so it's out there um, embedded in the citations at this point. Um, but I was thinking in terms of the question more general that all of the projects that we talked about today um, whether they get picked up by whatever, whoever they, whoever uses them, and the fact that they're, that they exist and they're still going on and there's interest, I think it's really important. Um, and I don't think that work will get, you know, I, I think that work will not, is not wasted. And I think it does change, make changes in the world. So I'm just, you know, just hope that those just keep on however they get, uh, you know, um, used by whoever. <laughs> but so just a general comment on that. Okay, and I think we have about time for just one more question. So I'm going to make this really pretty broad. Um, what do you wish people knew about controlled vocabularies? whether it's just about your controlled vocabulary in, in particular or in general. Well, I'll start and, and say that um, I think people should know that that LC has come a long way. Um, and so, you know, I often hear people complain, this, this isn't in LCSH as if like that could never change or LCSH has this problem with it as if that could never change. Um, so I want people to know that um, changes are happening and, and the Library of Congress is open to changes. Similar to that, I would like people to know that um, change, changing these things is really difficult. There are processes that you work through and standards that you have to work with. And I think Change the subject. The documentary did a, a good job of, of showing how this works. Um, but the, the fact is, I think most librarians and pe people who work in libraries want to help you, want to get this work done. It's just, even within a small organization, it takes time. Um, the, I guess what I'd like to say is that um, for the Chicano Thesaurus, it's it's a historical project. I mean, it started a long time ago, started by people and then continued by more people. And it's an ongoing thing. Um, so, yeah. And I appreciate all the people that started it out, started, you know, that created it. Uh, my one is that control vocabularies are useful. I mean, in this group, it's just taken for granted. But when working with others, uh, it's uh, no, no, we need this. Um, but also trying to not make it seem overly complicated, but just as, as it is important, it's, it's easily grasped and anyone really can work together to, to create controlled vocabularies. It's not something that's isolated just to, you know, your cataloger in the library or, or librarians in general. Uh, and that's what our project is seeking to do is show that you can grow control vocabularies with your communities, um, whether or not you deem libraries as a formal institution useful to your communities, the use of controlled vocabularies to improve access will help uh, your communities. Uh, and hopefully, I know there's a question about linked data. I'm hoping that um, that will help expand the application of control vocabularies. Stacey, any last thoughts? I wanna give you an opportunity to speak if you want. Um, yeah, just get involved. It's, it's really, um, if you think that something needs to be changed, don't hesitate to get involved. Um, I've been doing this for a year now and I feel like I've learned so much and contributed to so much just by asking questions and being annoying, so. 
go for it. <laughs> so I think we'll end on that. Be annoying. <laughs> Ask questions. Um, I want to thank all of our presenters today. This has been a fantastic discussion. I want to thank ACRL and RBMS for convening this conversation today. Um, and I want to thank all of our attendees for your thoughtful questions and your attention today. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and it was my pleasure to moderate this conversation. Thank you to the organizers. Um, and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, Amber. You were you were all amazing and fantastic, and I learned so much. Likewise, I really enjoyed this presentation. It was so incredible to hear about y'all's projects. Same Hopefully here. We can get yeah, together same again. Here. I'm just.